Chapter 7, Section 2, is government compatible with anarchism? Now, I'd like to add a personal note at the beginning of this section. There has come to be a, a distinction, a nuance within the anarchist milieu and within uh, political science as within the current space of discussion um, since when this document was originally written. The document originally states that, of course not, government is not compatible with anarchism, but we've arrived at a different definitional set for anarchism as uh, for a government as it has come today. There is sort of big G government that is intrinsically tied with the state that is the sort of status of of course not. But when talking about the sort of operating modalities and how a people uh, align themselves and organize themselves, this is sort of like small g government and the sort of governing mentalities and the go governing uh, methodologies that people have um, in how they organize their society. And so this sort of becomes a sticking point and an arguing point depending on the spaces you're engaging in. And so I just want to preface this with this is sort of a big G government um, slash state usage of government in this section. With that being said, here is the section. Chapter 7, Section 2. Is government compatible with anarchism? Of course not. But ironically, this is the conclusion arrived at by Hart's analysis of the British voluntarists, particularly Aubert Her Her uh, Herbert. Voluntarism was a fringe part of the right-wing individualist movement inspired by Herbert Spencer, a spokesman for free market capitalism in the later half of the 19th century. As with Molinari, there's a problem with presenting this ideology as anarchist, namely that, that its leading light, Herbert, re explicitly rejected the label anarchist. Herbert was clearly aware of individualist anarchism and distanced himself from it. He argued that such a system would be pandemonium. He thought that people should not direct our attacks as the anarchists do against all government, against government in itself, but only against the overgrown, the exaggerated, the insolent, unreasonable, and indefensible forms of government, which are found everywhere today. Capital G, big government, should be strictly limited to its legitimate duties in defense of self-ownership and individual rights. He stressed that we are governmentalists, formally constituted by the nation, employing in this matter of force the majority method. Moreover, Herbert knew of and in, in rejected individualist anarchism, considering it to be founded on a fatal mistake. As such, claims that he was an anarchist or so-called anarcho-capitalist cannot be justified. Hart is aware of this slight problem, quoting Herbert's claim that he aimed for regularly constituted government generally accepted by all citizens for the prote protection of the individual. Like Molinari, Herbert was aware that anarchism was a form of socialism and that the political aims could not be artificially separated from its economic and social aims. Again, I'd like to add an addendum here and make a distinction. Though anarchism has a historic tie to socialism, there are other forms of anarchist analysis and methodologies, and anarchism has come to have a wide set of tools in its tool, tool belt that can align and modify a whole host of styles of economic and political systems. So while it does have a historical tie to socialism, it does have ties to syndicalism. It does have ties, unfortunately, to things like primitivism. It does have ties to communism. It does have ties to other things. And anarchism unto itself has come to sort of reference this lens of analysis and this methodology that you can approach a problem with. Uh, with that said, back to the document. As such, he was right not to call his ideas anarchism as it would result in confusion, particularly as anarchism was a much larger movement than his. As Hart acknowledges, Herbert faced the same problems that Molinari had with labeling his philosophy. Like Molinari, he rejected the term anarchism, which he associated with the socialism of Proudhon and terrorism. While quite tolerant of individualist anarchism, he thought they were mistaken in their rejections of government. However, Hart knows better than Herbert about his own ideas, arguing that his ideology is in fact a new form of anarchism, since the most important aspects of the modern state, the monopoly of the use of force in a given area, is rejected in no uncertain terms by both men. He does mention that Benjamin Tucker called Herbert a true anarchist in everything but name, but Tucker denied that Kropokin was an anarchist, suggesting that he was hardly a reliable guide. As it stands, it seems that Tucker was mistaken in his evaluation of Herbert's politics. 
Economically, Herbert was not an anarchist, arguing that the state should protect Lockean property rights. Of course, Hart may argue that these economic differences are not relevant to the issue of Herbert's anarchism, but that is simply to repeat the claim that anarchism is simply concerned with government, a claim which is hard to support. This position cannot be maintained given that both Herbert and Molinari defended the right of capitalists and landlords to force their employees and tenants to follow their orders. Their governments existed to defend the capitalists from rebellious workers, to prevent, uh, to break unions, to uh, break strikes and occupations. In other words, they were a monopoly of the use of force in a given area to enforce monopoly power in a given area, namely the wishes of the property owner. While they may have argued that this was defense of liberty, in reality, it's the defense of power and authority. What about if we just look at the political aspects of his ideas? Did Herbert actually advocate anarchism? Far from it. He clearly demanded a minimal state based on voluntary taxation. The state would not use any force of any kind except for purposes of restraining force. He argued that in his system, while the state should compel no services and exact no payments by force, it should be free to conduct many useful undertakings in competition with all voluntary agencies, in dependence on voluntary payments. As such, the state would remain, and unless he is using the term state in some highly unusual way, it's, clearly that it's clear that he means a system where individuals live under a single elected government as their common law maker, judge, and defender within a given territory. This becomes clearer once we look at how the state would be organized. In his essay, A Politician in Sight of Haven, Herbert does discuss the franchise, stating it would be limited to those who paid a voluntary income tax. Anyone paying it would have the right to vote. Those who did not pay it, as is just, without the franchise. There would be no other tax. The law would be strictly limited, of course, and the government must confine itself simply to the defense of life and property, whether as regards internal or external defense. In other words, Herber, Herbert was a minimal statist, with his government elected by a majority of those who chose to pay their income tax and funded by that, and by any other voluntary taxes they decide to pay. Whether individuals and companies could hire their own private police in such a regime is irrelevant in determining whether it's anarchy. This can be best by seen. Uh, this can best be seen by comparing Herbert with Ayn Rand. No one would ever claim Rand was an anarchist. I hope no one would ever claim Ayn Rand is an anarchist. Yet. Her ideas were extremely similar to Herbert's. Like Herbert, Rand supported laissez-faire capitalism and was against the initiation of force. Like Herbert, she extended the principle to favor a government funded by voluntary means, government financing in a free society, the virtue of selfish, uh, selfishness, page 116 to uh, 120. Moreover, like Herbert, she explicitly denied being an anarchist and again, like Herbert, thought the idea of competing self uh, defense agencies would result in chaos. The similarities with Herbert are clear, yet no no so-called anarcho-capitalists would claim that Rand was an anarchist, yet they do claim Herbert was. This position is, of course, deeply illogical and flows from the non-anarchist nature of so-called anarcho-capitalism. Perhaps unsurprisingly, when Rothbard discusses the idea of the voluntarists, he fails to address the key issue of who determines the laws being enforced in society. For Rothbard, the key issue is who is enforcing the law, not where that law comes from as long as, of course, it's a law code he approved of. The implications of this is significant, as it implies that anarchism need not be opposed to either state nor government. This can be clearly seen from Rothbard's analysis of voluntary taxation. Rothbard correctly notes that Herbert advocated voluntary taxation as a means of funding a state whose basic role was to enforce Lockean property rights. For Rothbard, the key issue was not who determines the law, but who enforces it. For Rothbard, it should be privatized police and courts, and he suggests that the voluntary taxation, uh, taxationists have never attempted to answer this problem. They have rather stubbornly assumed that one would set up a competing defense agency within a state's territorial limits. If the state did bar such firms, then that state is not a genuine free market. However, if the government did permit free competition in defense service, there would soon no longer be a central government over the territory. Defense agencies, po police, and judicial would compete with one another in the same uncoerced manner as the producers of any other service on the market. Power and market, page 122 and 123. However, this misses the point totally. 
The key issue that Rothbard ignores is who determines the laws which these private defense agencies would enforce. If the laws are determined by a central government, the state, then the fact that citizens can hire private police and attend private courts does not stop the regime being statist. We can safely assume Rand, for example, would have no problem with companies providing private security guards or the hiring of private detectives within the context of her minimal state. Ironically, Rothbard stresses the need for such a monopoly legal system. Quote, while the government would cease to exist, the same cannot be said for a constitution or a rule of law, which in fact would take on in the free society a far more important function than at present. For the freely competing judicial agencies would have been guided by a body of absolute law to enable them to distinguish objectively between defense and invasion. This law embodying elaborations upon the basic injunction to defend person and property from acts of invasion would be codified in the basic legal code. Failure to establish such a code of law would tend to break down the free market, for the defense against invasion could not be adequately achieved. So, if you violate the absolute law, defending absolute property rights, then you'd be in trouble. The problem now lies in determining who sets that law. Rothbard is silent on how his system of monopoly laws are determined or specified. The voluntarists did propose a solution, namely a central government elected by the majority of those who voluntarily decide to pay an income tax, aka a state. In other words, in the words of Herbert, quote, We agree that there must be a central agency to deal with crime, an agency that defends the liberty of all men and employs force against the use of force. But my central agency rests upon voluntary support, while whilst Mr. Levy's central agency rests on compulsory support. All and all Rothbard is concerned over private cops would exist or not. This lack of concern over the existence of the state and the big G government flows from the strange fact that so-called anarcho-capitalists commonly use the term anarchism to refer to any philosophy that opposes forms of initiary coercion. Notice that government or state does not play in this definition. Thus, Rothbard can analyze Herbert's politics without commenting on who determines the law his private defense agencies enforce. For Rothbard, an anarchist society is defined as one where there's no legal possibility for coercive aggression against the person and property of any individual. He then moved on to the state, defining that as an institution which possesses one or both, almost always both, of the following properties. One, it acquires its income by physical coercion, known as taxation, and two, it acquires and usually obtains a coerced monopoly of the provision of defense services, police and courts, over a given territorial area. This is a highly unusual definition of anarchism. Given that it utterly fails to mention or define government, uh, define government, it doesn't talk about really any of the hierarchical power structures. It does nothing to address the inequality and inequity that normal anarchists or anarchists talk about. This perhaps is understandable as any attempt to define it in terms of monopoly of decision-making power results in showing that capitalism is statist. See chapter one for a summary on this. The key issue here is the term legal possibility. That suggests a system of laws which determine what is coercive aggression and what constitutes what is and what is not legitimate property. Herbert is considered by so-called anarcho-capitalists as one of them, which brings us to a strange conclusion that for so-called anarcho-capitalists, you can have a system of anarchism in which there is a government and state as long as the state does not impose taxation or stop private police forces from operating. As Rothbard actually argues, if a government based on voluntary taxation permits free competition, the result will be a purely free market system. The previous government would now simply be one competing defense agency among many on the market. Power and Market, page 124. That the government, the state, is specifying what is and what is not legal does not seem to bother him or even cross his mind, apparently. Why should it, when the existence of government is irrelevant to his definition of anarchism and the state? 
The private police force are enforcing a monopoly law determined by the state seems hardly, uh, hardly a step in the right direction, nor can it be considered as anarchism. Perhaps this is unsurprising, for under his system, there would be, quote, a basic common law code, which all would have to abide by, as well as, quote, some way of resolving disputes that will gain a majority consensus in society, whose decision will be accepted by the great majority of the public. Society without a state, page 205. At least, Herbert is clear that this would be a governmental system, the state. Unlike Rothbard, who assumes a monopoly law, but seems to think that this is not a government or, nor a state. As David Weick argued, this is illogical, for according to Rothbard, quote, all would have to conform to the same legal code, and this can be only achieved by a means of forceful action of adherence to the code against those who flout it. And so in his system, there would stand over, every, again, there would stand over against every individual the legal authority of all the others. An individual who did not recognize private property as legitimate would surely perceive this as tyranny of law, a tyranny of the majority or at least the most powerful. In short, almost a hydra-headed state. If the law code is itself unitary, then this multiple state might be said to have properly a single head, the law. But it looks as though one might still call this a state under Rothbard's definition by satisfying de facto one of his pair of sufficient conditions. It asserts and usually obtains a coerced monopoly of provision of defense service, police and courts, over a given territorial, territorial area. Hobbes's individual sovereign would seem to have become many sovereigns but with but one law. However, and in truth, therefore a single sovereign in Hobbes' most important sense of the latter term, one might better and less confusingly call this a libertarian state rather than anarchy. The obvious recipients of the coercion of the new state would be those who rejected the authority of their bosses and landlords. Those who reject the Lockean property rights Rothbard and Herbert hold so dear. In such cases, the rebels and any defense agency, like, say, a union which defended them, would be driven out of business as it violated the law of the land. How this is different from a state banning competing agencies is hard to determine. This is a difficulty, argues Wake, which results from the attachment of a principle of private property and of unrestricted accumulation of wealth to the principle of individual liberty. This increases sharply the possibility that many reasonable people who respect their fellow men and women will find themselves outside the law because of dissent from a property interpretation of liberty, end quote. Similarly, there is an economic, uh, similarly, this is the economic result of capitalism. One can imagine, White continues, that those who lose out badly in the free competition of Rothbard's economic system, perhaps a considerable number, might regard the legal authority as an alien power. State for them based on violence, which and might be quite unmoved by the fact that just as under the 19th century capitalism, a principle of liberty was the justification for 